about, uh, about his, his trip back home and what God did there. So please say good morning and, uh, and welcome Joseph. Namaste. That is a one word greeting for all time, day or night, from the heart of people. Just namaste. And uh, he's right, you guys prayed and kicked me out of here. <laughs> and I missed you so much, I prayed myself back in. <laughs> okay, just a little bit of history about the Christianity in India. Counting from disciple Thomas to this day, more than 2,000 years of Christian history in India, I was born as St. Thomas Christian in that tradition. But 1.2 billion people, only 2.3% are called Christians, not born again Christians, all, all the Christian mess, together 1.2. That means how all these super evangelists do a bad job over there. They come here, collect a lot of money, go there, build mansions, Bible schools, orphanages, but still only 1.2% Christians. And in my hometown all the way south, we don't have a Calvary Chapel, so I had to go to a Pentecostal fellowship for worshiping Sunday. And uh, in my hometown, there is one place where my older sister used to worship, so I go there first. Then I go to different places. They will ask me to witness, and uh, I will go up there and uh, tell them, my witnessing is a lot different from you guys do around here. What they do is, so oh, I was sick, I had my shoulder pain, I prayed, and the Lord healed me wonderfully, that kind of witnessing there. So I was witnessing all the time about what we do here in refuge or in the Calvary Chapel. Having been saved by the grace of God, what we do to look back to the same place where we've been cut out and still see people lying there and reaching out and trying to save them, that is our kind of witnessing here, I told them. So I had an opportunity to go to a Bible seminary called the Peniel Seminary. My nephew is a pastor teacher there, so I went there for something else. They do have a, a different wing. They take care of about 125 uh, children, children of uh, poor single parents, and they take care of them for everything. So somebody gave me some money when I left, I had to distribute it over there, so I gave part of that money to that organization there. And then I met the president of the seminary. He invited me for breakfast and then asked me to, you know, took me around and uh, through the kitchen there was a master chef over there. He was a, he's a recovering alcoholic. One whole year, no drinking. So he asked me to, I told him about my story, how I was an alcoholic and how I got redeemed. So he asked me to witness to him, I did. Then he told, asked me to witness to their children, I mean, students there. It was on the same day President Obama was in India, celebrating India's Republic Day in the North. And uh, I, myself, a very unknown ambassador of God, was witnessing to uh, seminary students in South. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then I had the opportunity to be with a, a group of recovering alcoholics in my hometown itself. And uh, they were pretty young people with so messed up lives and now they are recovering. Every week they meet there Wednesday night and uh, one of the pastors, a long time friend of mine, he is uh, in charge of that uh, uh, operation there. And uh, also I was there, very happy. And uh, there was a crusade 
in the hometown. In the heart of the city, there is an open uh, stadium. And this uh, famous Indian evangelist was uh, speaking there for three days. And I attended one night. And the problem with them is they are emphasizing the need to speak in tongues or pray in tongues or prophesying and things like that. So in one fellowship, when I went for the next Saturday, uh, Sunday worship, I witnessed to them. I said, uh, it's very good to be able to speak in tongues or prophesying as, uh, as far as it is followed according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 12 and 13. You know, that will be very great. But more than that, there is a lot more to be done as a Christian because faith without works is dead. So you need to do something. Then I explain to them what we do around here instead of speaking tongues. So they kind of took it, you know. They didn't beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> And the political situation has changed a lot. India has 82% of the Hindus, the, the whole population. And the first minority is Muslim. You know, Christians are the second minority. Now, the political wing of the ruling party, there is a one fanatic group called the Self, National Self-Rule Party. They want India to be 100% Hindus. So they are inviting people, all the converts, back to Hinduism, sort of intimidating them, you know. It's a kind of a, uh, something like Muslims do. And the Indian Muslims are mostly converted from Hindus, so they want everybody to come back to Hinduism. That's what is going on here. Still. You hear a lot about the persecution in India. There is persecution in some pockets, like where there are fanatics. But where I was born, where I used to live, is still in that place. There is no persecution. Every nook and corner, there is a Christian symbol. Mostly, you know, Catholic or Protestant, you know, th things like that. There are public meetings going on with the loudspeakers blowing all around. Nobody is getting offended by that. That is one truth about India. They are tolerating everything. So when you hear about persecution, don't believe, don't pay one penny for that reason. They need to witness the super evangelist. They need to live a Christian life as an example. Then only people will convert by faith. Otherwise, it is a waste of money. There is a one evangelist I know by name, K.P. Yohanan. He has an engineering college. He has a medical college. He has a Bible schools. But with all these things, you are still 1.2% of the population. And most people are now trying to go back because they were not converted based on their faith by material benefits, giving them something to make their life better on earth, so they change their faith from Hinduism to Christianity. That's what is happening there. That needs to be changed. It takes a lot of prayers. Thank you for your patience. And uh, nice to be back. <laughs> Did I lose my fight? Hey, stay here a moment. Let's pray for, let's pray for your country. Joseph, where are you going? Where are you going? Let's pray. All right, join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for bringing Joseph back to us safely. Lord, we pray for the people of India. We pray for your hope and your salvation. We pray for the Christian testimony that is there. That, Lord, you would refine your people, that you would lead them in your word. And, Lord, that you would lead them in faith and acts of service and, and genuine love. That your word would transform lives. We pray for uh, the spreading of, uh, of your love, the truth of of faith in Christ, the, the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection. We pray that you bring hope to, to the lost and the hopeless and strengthen your people. Lord, thank you for the uh, opportunity you gave to, to Joseph. We pray that the seeds that, that he had opportunity to, to share would, would be planted in hearts and grow fruit for your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen.
Okay, if you need a Bible, then uh, then Drew's got some Bibles for you, and uh, raise your hand if you need a Bible. Um, those are, we're going to be in the book of Romans, so go ahead and turn to the, the book of Romans in chapter 12. Drew's on the run. One more in the back. Drew, one more in the back. You're pretty good with that. You could do, you could do Cracker Jacks. And then we, should, we should have. Hey, uh, Daniel Torres is going to be leading us in the Word, and, uh, um, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to give Dan a hard time before he comes up. A, uh, about a month ago, I, uh, I invite this young kid to teach the Word, and, uh, <laughs> and it was good. Um, but then there was this part that just was off in some other direction about a little girl's play show, My Little Pony. So I got to follow up on this. I got to follow up on this because since then, I, I, find, I start asking around. I, I find out that now for me, when I was like eight years old, I was too manly for this show. So... <laughs> so so I follow up, I start asking around, and it turns out there's like a subculture phenomenon of, uh, of My Little Pony fans that, that transcends gender and age, and, uh, and there's just a lot of people that like My Little Pony. And then I, I don't know what's going on. And, uh, and so then I start, I start asking around, and I found out, it's, I read reviews, it's, it's supposed to be, oh, sorry. Siri's bugging me. Um, I start, but Siri, Siri, asked, Siri just asked me a question. Uh, so I start asking around, and I, find, and I read reviews, and it's supposed to be one of the better shows on television, regardless of, of what age it's for. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. But, uh, but I want to say this. Um, I, I, this. This is something that, that I know about Dan as, uh, as a friend, as I've gotten to know him. Uh, human beings pick a lot of reasons why we should dislike each other. Uh, in the flesh... We, we come up with a lot of excuses why, a reason why I don't have to like that person. Because that person, whether it be, uh, be color or what they wear or um, the things they like, the things they're into, we choose a lot of reasons why not to like each other. Uh, it, is, it is a rare thing and, uh, and something that, that certainly stands out when, when someone, rather than finding reasons not to like other people finds ways in which to love people. Those same excuses that one person uses to, to hate, um, we in Christ are called to, to look at those things as ways to love. We're called to be all things to all people so that by any means some might be saved. And what I've come to know about Dan, when he uh, finds something peculiar about somebody, and, and we actually strike up a conversation about this, um, Dan looks and says, maybe that's the way we can reach those people. Um, uh, whether it's uh, it's a love for a little girl's TV show, but which, by the way, <laughs> I <laughs> that was a double amen. That was <laughs> um, but uh, but very seriously about this, a uh, uh, Dan and I were talking. There there are some sub some pockets of subculture in society which uh, which even Christians don't bother to to reach into. Um, I told you last week about my friends who, who go out to, uh, to raves to go and, uh, and reach the lost. You guys met them. One of the, the things that really struck them about it when they went was they kept asking, kept asking, could not find a single church that was actually bothering to reach the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of kids that show up to, to raves on a regular basis. And uh, um, because they're different, because they're, they're not like us. But is that an excuse to, to dislike them or is it a way to reach them? And, uh, and same thing about Dan, whether, whatever subculture it is, uh, Dan wants to reach them. Now, I will follow up with this. I asked my kids yesterday to watch the show, and my nine-year-old girl said, it was pretty good, still kind of little kiddish. So, <laughs> so, so, so with that, let's see if Dan can redeem himself. Welcome Dan up stage. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, 
I just want to start off by saying I may have talked a bit about My Little Pony last time I was up, but at least I didn't talk about Harry Potter, Chris. <laughs> I'm just joking, you guys. I love Harry Potter. It's fun stuff. <laughs> I'm surprised you guys are all still here after that. If you guys are seeing the way our church runs and you're still here for the ride, then God bless you. Okay, so um, before I jump into this, um, I'm glad, first of all, all these hearts that we see up here, we are in a passage that deals with love. And love beyond just the arrows, meaning the romantic love, you know, the, the love that you feel, the little you know, uh, Twitter in your heart. Wait, Twitter's something else. Okay, no, the, the little flutters that you get in your heart and, and the excitement from uh, somebody who has romantic feelings for you. We as Christians are called to much more than that. There's, there's a love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a love for our God, first and foremost. But what I'm going to be talking about today is a love for your enemies, and I'm going to be a bit of a jerk about it today, so <laughs> I got to apologize ahead of time um, because I'm going to be kind of firm, but I think it needs to be said because I'm just going to be reading it as it's spoken here from the Word. So if you will turn to Romans chapter 12, that's where we are, somewhere between Genesis and Revelation in there, just flip around till you find it. <laughs> All right. But I'm going to be a little bit nervous. I got all my family here today, and they're all looking at me like, <laughs> not all of them, but a lot of them, the important ones. If you guys aren't here, pointing at the camera right now, by the way. It's, there we go. Anyway, <laughs> Romans 12 is where we are, Romans 12. I'm going to start off in verse 14. Romans 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. I think that's enough. We need to pray right now after just that, <laughs> right? Lord, I ask that you be the one speaking today. I'm absolutely not worthy or fit to give this message, but you, God, you alone, when you speak to these hearts, when you open the hearts and call them to respond to you, that's where change happens. That's where people are fulfilled. That's where people see their purpose and their future in you. Lord, I ask that you touch every one of us here. Start with me, because I really need it. Open our eyes. Open our ears. We give you this time in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Now, remember, right now, the context is love. It, it starts um, off, if you guys want to turn back a bit. I actually don't have a Bible myself. Sorry. Let me go ahead and grab one over here. If you guys didn't get one, you should. Back. Okay. I thought I'd get one of those holy one flips. You guys ever get that? Just, like, open it up. It's exactly where you want to be. I love that. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to come back to verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves, never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. He then goes on to say, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now remember, love is not just a good idea or a nice sentiment or a, a, a decent aspect of the Christian faith. It's everything. The entire law and the prophets are summed up in just two things. You guys know what that is? The first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second thing is to love your neighbor the way you already do yourself. You take care of yourself. You, you, you feed yourself. You meet your needs. No matter uh, whether you think you're awesome or whether you think you suck, the fact of the matter is you meet your needs. And the way he's calling us to love, that's the way you already love yourself. So, spoiler alert, I am going to be beating a dead horse in a sense. More about the, the ponies later, but for right now, um, uh, story time, okay? 
everybody gather on him. I kind of feel like we should be sitting like Indian style for this. Like, okay, anyway. When we were kids, you guys ever done that? You know, you all sit around for the stories. Okay, story time. In the jungles of Ecuador, along the Amazon River, there lived the people that called themselves the Waurani. Now, the Waurani were notorious in their region for their violent and ruthless actions. They would attack the homes of families at night, and it was just as likely to be their own people as any other tribe. They found little issue with strangling or spearing one's own wife or children on a whim, and even held it as custom to kill them just to bury them with the father. The surrounding people knew them as the Auka, which meant the savages. In 1955, five men decided to do something about it. They set out not only to make contact with these people, but to show them real love and compassion in spite of the brutality and violence. These men's names were Jim Elliott, Ed McCauley, Peter Fleming, Roger Udarian, and Nate Saint. Now, after several months of lowering gifts from a plane over their territory, the men finally set up camp along the Curare River, and they began calling out for the Warani people. After a few days of this, they finally made contact. So three Warani show up on the bank of the river on the other side, and we might call them today maybe like a young couple. You see, there was this young girl who came against the wishes of her family, and this dude who's interested in her, he's like, yeah, I'll go. You know, and of course, you've got to send a chaperone, so you've got this older lady who's going to go with them and chaperone them. And these are, these are the three that meet the, them on the other bank of the river. And uh, uh, what they do is they make contact, and they actually had a blast. They exchanged gifts. Uh, the missionaries had some hamburgers with them. Um, they gave them like a little toy plane. They even took the young man for a ride in the plane uh, 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 just overhead. And he would shout down to his friends that he would see like, hey, I'm in a plane. You know, or however you say it. Like, was a goal. You know, I don't know how you say it in their language. You know, he's, and he's shouting to them like, oh my gosh. So he's having a grand old time. Um, and it, when it got dark, you know, the, the two younger ones went home. And the older one stayed behind and, and wanted to chat more with him because she was really interested in these, these strange but friendly foreigners. Now, when the girl gets home uh, without her chaperone, her older brother is furious. So, so the young boy, he decides he's going to cover his own butt, and he tells the older brother, oh, um, well, we were attacked by the foreigners. And that's why we're, we're here without our chaperone. We got separated, you see. So this was the only reason the Warani needed. That's really it. That's all they needed. Because on that night, the Warani set out to engage their new enemy, the missionaries. On January 8th, only days after their arrival on this land, Jim Elliott, Ed McCauley, Peter Fleming, Roger Udarian, I'm getting it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, could you? Yeah, you got it. Okay. And Nate Saint, it's so funny because like, this is like, like <laughs> I'm getting down with some blues here. But anyway, on this day, these five men were speared to death by the very people they came to love. So when God, when God calls us to love our enemies here in verse 14, and he says, bless those who persecute you and bless them and do not curse them. You got to be asking yourself, does God actually expect that from us? Let me elaborate. Does God actually call us to love them, to serve them, to pray for them, to care about them, even to honor them? Is that really what God means by all this? Well, let me start off uh, with this point. We are all going to die. 10 out of 10 people, it's medically proven, 10 out of 10 people are going to die. So when we are then given this promise of eternity, when we accept Jesus, why doesn't he just rapture us up right there? I say, Jesus, you are my Lord, and I accept the free gift of forgiveness and salvation and an eternity with you, and bam, you're in heaven. And you don't have to worry about, you know, all the stuff that you were probably going to do after accepting it anyway, because you were probably going to muck things up a bit, right? Or uh, worse yet, maybe you were, you know, since we're surrounded by all these sinners, you know, we might get some of their dirty sin on us and it would contaminate us. Oh no. <laughs> Why are we still here when we accept that gift? 
It's because we're on a mission, a rescue mission, a hostage rescue mission. And in this case, the hostages have a pretty bad case of Stockholm Syndrome. I don't know if you guys know what Stockholm Syndrome is. It's, uh, it's actually this, this psychological um, state where when someone has been held captive by someone and they haven't really been treated that poorly, they actually begin to feel empathy and compassion towards their captors it, to the point that they're so fond of them that they would actually defend their captors. That's Stockholm Syndrome. Now, also, let me let you know, in this rescue mission, it's not a good idea to shoot the hostages. It's a rather bad one. So the very ones that you want to free are then attacking you. They consider you their enemy. They think that you're coming to attack them on top of that. See, the image of Christians in the Western world is where we're believed to be backbiting and vicious and ignorant and arrogant. Why would this be said, brothers and sisters in Christ, of people who are called to bless those who persecute us? What are we supposed to do? If you look back, go back to verse 15, it says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Now in context, this is making a little more sense, you see. When it's talking about loving your enemies, and it says, now also you know, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. He's not just talking about your friends. This is what we call empathy, and he's asking for it for those who you actually don't get along with. Let's say that someone you're at odds with has something great. You know, somebody that you're upset with you know, gets a new house. Are you happy for them? That's what it's actually saying here. Because if you can't be happy for someone when something good happens to them, just because you're at odds with them, can I tell you guys honestly, you're actually in sin? You're hardening your heart and you're resisting what God is trying to do there. It's plain and simple. Also, on the flip side, if you're not weeping with those who weep, meaning you know something horrible happens to someone you dislike, do you say, serves them right? That's what you get. You're being completely void of mercy if you're in that state. That means you need to repent. Turn around. Now, I know I'm being a bit harsh, but I need to say this because we are the children of light. People look at us, and we may be the only Bible that they ever read. We're telling them this is what Jesus looks like. We go on in verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Now, I'm really guilty of this one. And I'm going to go off on a little bit of a rabbit trail here. But So verse 16 is actually echoing verse 3. And verse 3 says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. This is the notion that, well, I can't associate with them. If, if I'm sitting around with a bunch of people that are sinners, people are going to think that I'm a pot smoker, I'm a drunkard. You know, and they're going to think that I'm caught up in their debauchery. That's what's going to happen because they can't see me with them. They can't see me with, with nerds. They can't see me with... <laughs> Let me elaborate on that one. Okay, so. <laughs> you guys know it's coming <laughs> So in college, I took some animation classes. I love kids, and I love kids' media. I actually wanted to get into cinema. I wanted to um, either be in animation or character design. And it was in this, and actually studying it, that I came across the new generation of My Little Pony. And I saw that, and I said, wow, that's some decent character design. Oh my gosh, it's done by Lauren Faust. I love her work. I've seen some of the other stuff she does. And she's married to my favorite character designer. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm thinking, I would love to, to see how these people do this. It would be great to maybe even get involved, maybe you know, get a job doing something like that. It'd be awesome. And as I'm finding out, there's a lot of other people that are into it. Maybe there are other animators. Cool. And, and so I start learning more and more about it. And I find out these guys, I mean, they may not be animators, but they're really funny. They're telling tons of jokes online and, and using a lot of pictures from the show and, and adjusting them. And, and they're, they're kind of computer wizards. And I'm thinking, these guys are awesome. So I decide I'm going to go to a meetup. There's a bunch of them going out to a pizza place in San Diego. I drive down there. 
and I am wearing this shirt here. Now, you guys probably have no clue what this means. Good. Um, this is actually a, an abstraction of one of the um, cutie marks. I'm sorry. That's what it's called, but it's the tattoo that they got there. Um, and uh, it's, I thought it was kind of cool. It's a little hipster, you know, it's like, because it doesn't actually look like this. It's chromatone. It's melting. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm being artistic, you know? So I walk in to the pizza parlor, and I see a bunch of little, in my opinion, dweebs, you know, and they're sitting there actually playing with the ponies and, and, and playing Magic the Gathering. I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's like a little tabletop game, and, and some of them are just like just being loud and, and silly, and I... I And I left. <laughs> I turned around. I'm like, I'm, like, I'm going to go to, there's some, you know, there looks like some cute girls over at Starbucks. I'm going to go over there. I didn't meet Reagan yet, by the way. So, <laughs> um, um, so I left. And as I'm walking, um, I felt convicted. And this was the verse that God put on my heart. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Dan, look at you. Come on, man. Really? Like, Don't be haughty, but associate with lowly, those of low position, people that you look down on. Why would you think that you're so awesome and high and mighty that you can't be seen with these people? Okay, fine, God, all right. go in there. There you guys go. Okay, right. I sit down, I grab my sketchbook, and I just start throwing things on the ground. Okay, no. Um, and I, I start drawing, and I started drawing some of the characters. And, you know, people started talking to me. Hey, you're good, good. Oh, thanks, you know. Uh, do you have a favorite character? Okay, I'll, I'll draw that. Um, where are you from? Oh, I'm from around here. Cool. Um, how'd you get into this? And they start sharing a bit of, about themselves, and I found it really fascinating because they're not into it for the same reasons I am. I wanted to be in production, and they actually enjoy playing with ponies. Um, and so, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, okay, so I, I'm sitting there chatting with them, and they quickly get into talking about their beliefs and, and their worldviews. Huh. Have you, do, do you go to a church? Oh, no, no, no. No, well, wow. Uh, that seems like pretty strong emotions. Why not? Oh, Christians, man. No, they're, they're just ignorant. They're dumb. And I'm like, oh, uh, you might be surprised to know this. I actually went to Bible college. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's cool. That's cool, dude. That's cool. You know, and, and, and we actually um, got into a conversation. This was not one instance, by the way. I'm actually talking about several people in that one instance I was able to have this conversation with. And I was finding time after time that these people um, that I was meeting had a very, very bitter taste in their mouth about Christians. And yet when they saw someone loving them and not judging them, regardless of whatever it is they're into, even if we disagree on stuff, still being like, that's cool, dude. It, it made an impact. And it allowed me to show them that Jesus is not who you think he is. So, anyway, what that ended up turning into is I, I began to uh, do lots of ministries with them where I'm able to have these close connections. I actually did meet Reagan um, at... Um, one of these things I did. I'll get more into that at some other time, but I want to get back to the subject at hand here. See, going on with the same, yeah, there's one of them right there. Everyone point at him. No, I'm just um, But continuing on with this idea of, okay, not just afraid to associate with them, because when you associate with people that are going to disagree with you and are already having a bad taste in their mouth about who you are, they're going to attack and lash out. Maybe sometimes unintentionally. They're just going to take a jab at what you believe in. But in verse 17, it says, Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what's honorable in the sight of all. Because you guys are in the sight of all. There's a lot of eyes on you. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Boom. Now, I thought that was really heavy because maybe at this point you were beginning to feel like, you know, I guess I could do that. I could probably go talk to people that I, you know, think are weird. And, you know, I can probably be a little nicer. Uh, but when it says here that as far as it depends on you to live peaceably with all and not to repay any evil for evil because everybody's watching... 
Um, I think it just went back into the realm of impossible. Personally. See, this is actually a concept that, if you really think about it, is so impossible that there are teachers out there who have completely abandoned the concept of this is actually something we're called to do. And maybe he's actually saying something uh, a little bit more subversive here. You, you see, there is actually some popular books floating around wherein the, the author declares, and I quote, Jesus rejected two common ways of uh, responding to injustice, violence, and, uh, violent resistance and passive acceptance. Instead, Jesus advocates a third way, an assertive but nonviolent form of protest. By the way, this is my radio voice. You guys like it? It's good? All right, cool. So he goes on to state that when Jesus said, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. This author is saying that what Jesus is really advocating uh, was that if they struck you on the right cheek, then it's probably a backhand, which is a common oppression from a superior to an inferior. But if you were to offer the left cheek to the assailant, then they would have to use their fists and they would have to fight you as if you were their equal. Ah. And then the author uh, continues to say that when Jesus declared, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now, Jesus is actually saying, if you are forced to carry a Roman's gear, then hold on to their stuff for another mile. Don't give it back just yet, because you got them right where you want them. You put them in a disconcerting situation, and I quote, that they risk getting in trouble, or they'll have to wrestle their gear back from you. Now, lastly, the author goes on to say that it, it, Jesus said, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And that's, that's what Jesus said. But the author says, okay, Jesus is saying that you should do this because then you'll be naked and you'll be showing them how the man is really oppressing you and how messed up the system is. Also, you'll be naked and anybody looking at you will be shamed. <laughs> we got him. Can we turn to Matthew 5 for a second? You're going to go a few books back. I actually want you guys to read this. And I know I end up making you guys read like two full passages. You're going to come up here and speak, but tough. Too much Bible. Now, we're going to go to Matthew 5. I'm going to actually start in 38. Matthew 5, verse 38. Let's hear what this actually says in context. Now, if you, you have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I, says Jesus, I say, don't even resist an evil person. So, oops, I already see a problem with the passive-aggressive guy's argument, but I'll continue here. Uh, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, other the other cheek also. If you're sued in court and your shirt's taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away those who want to borrow. You have heard the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And in that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight both to the evil and the good. He sends his rain to the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even the corrupt tax collectors are doing that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But if you are perfect... Even as your father in, uh, but you are to be perfect, <laughs> just as your father in heaven is perfect. Uh, again, uh, uh, who in here is perfect? Anybody? No, I, I actually can't raise my hand. I'm actually asking you to. Okay, we got one. Boom. <laughs> Y'all need healing. You need something. Right there. Okay, no, you guys, the, the word for perfect here, the Greek word is teleos. Now, it means complete. It means you're one of integrity. You remember when Chris was talking about integrity? Uh, uh, you're mature. Uh, and believe it or not, it also means you're grown up. You know, we're supposed to be complete in Christ, are we not? We have everything we need. We have this eternity, and we're just passing through here, right? We're called to be ones of integrity and mature. We're called to be grown up. See, you're going to heaven. You're a soldier of Christ on mission to rescue souls from captivity. Can I tell you, man up and take a hit? Are we really called to fight for justice at the cost of making sure that the lost are defeated and the children of God are victorious over them? Is that what God is asking of us? 
You see, Jesus with the political movements, what did he say with the tax collectors, with, with Caesar, who's, who's really overdoing it with the, with, with the tax, and you're giving most of what you have to Caesar? He, Jesus doesn't say, like, all right, I'll tell you guys how to get him. I'm going to show you guys how to get him. We're going to do something really subversive. No, he says, just Caesar's money. It's just earthly money. Give it back to him. My kingdom's not of this world. See, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Jesus was so eternally minded. He knew that these little injustices that we think are a really big deal are actually very, very minor in the grand scheme of things. See, back in Romans 12, if you guys want to go over there, I'm listening for the pages flipping. I love the sound. It's it's beautiful. Back in Romans 12. Well, some of y'all had it saved. Just can hear that. And he goes on in verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. See, the same concept. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, you feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll heat burning coals on his head. Don't overcome, be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Now, I know the burning coals thing is, is up for a little debate. You know, they, some, one group says, okay, by putting burning coals, you're actually talking about lit coals that you're putting on a headdress for the person for them to actually take home. It'll warm them on the way and they could take it and put it into their fireplace or hearth or whatever those things are called back in those days. And it warms their home. So you're actually doing a, a gift of hospitality that warms them up from the inside, like a, like a soft answer turning uh, away wrath. Um, Okay, so that's one camp. The other camp says, no, it's, it's just what it says. You know, by, by, you, by doing nice to them, you're really pouring burning coals of shame on them. And man, you get to watch them burn with conviction. Okay, so you got these two camps. What do I say? It doesn't even matter. But I actually do not care what side it is. Because here's the heart he's asking for you either way. Actually love your enemies. And desire the best for them. Let God take care of the justice department of making things right and righting wrongs. That's God's department. Wrath is for him, not for you. You are called to love. You are given two things. All of this is two things. Love God, first and foremost, with everything you got. And then love your enemies. That's what you're called to do. A, a pastor I, I follow, named David, David Goodsick, puts it this way. We can see that we can destroy our enemy by making him our friend. If there's one Christian I would want to ask about this, how this concept works in the real world, it would probably be Steve Saint. Now, Steve Saint was Nate Saint's son. See, no more than five years, the, sorry, yeah, no more than a year, actually, after the five men were killed, by the Wa'orani, Elizabeth Elliot, now the widow of Jim Elliot, and Rachel Saint, the sister of Nate Saint, made peaceful contact through the Wa'orani women, and they were actually um, welcomed in to learn their customs. And a few years later, they invited Steve Saint, Nate Saint's son, to join them. You see, the unmerited, unconditional love and forgiveness of these three, in spite of all the pain that the Wa'orani had caused them, it touched their hearts. And the Walrani were finally ready and open to hear the gospel as it was meant to be heard, a message of love and forgiveness. And in June of 1965, Steve Saint stood in the same river where his father was killed. Alongside three of the same individuals who speared his father to death right there in that river. Steve wasn't there to mourn, and he wasn't there to get vengeance on these three. He was there because these three were baptizing him. Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Father, I I thank you that we cannot do this on our own because this weight the weight of being able to love 
in spite of hurt, to love in spite of anger, is impossible unless you do it through me, unless you do it through us. I ask that we surrender to you and love you first and foremost, and that your love fills us up so much that it's spilling out all over the place, that people look at us and they're just getting loved if they come within a 50-mile radius of us. I ask that that is how we are known, creatures of love, because we are creatures of your grace. Thank you for this time, God, that we had to hear your word spoken from so many people. And I, I ask, let it affect us. Let it change the way we live and let it change the way we love. In your son's name, amen. Thank you, Dan. You stood before creation Eternity in your hands You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. A sin weight upon your shoulders, my soul now to stand.